Let's have a look at a circa 1985 Takahashi Epsilon 130 130 millimeter f3.3 astrograph. And here it is in all of its Takahashi-ness, a 130mm f3.3 hyperbolic astrograph with an ED corrector element in the focuser. Certainly one of the most rare Takahashi telescopes ever to run across my desk. Now we want to be sure to differentiate this from the new Epsilon 130D model, the D presumably for digital imaging. You can tell the difference because all of these lime green bits here have been painted black. While you will see quite a bit of information out there on this new Epsilon 130D model and some quite spectacular photographs taken with it, there's almost nothing about this original telescope that's out there. So let's find out together what it's all about. So here it is in a remarkably compact tube, quite heavy for how small this thing is. I'm measuring 15.3 pounds with what you see here. It actually feels a lot heavier when you carry it because this thing is so compact. It's not much bigger than a typical run-of-the-mill Orion Star Blast. And in fact, seeing it out in the field, I had friends who said, you know what, I'm going to go out and buy some yellow-green or yellow-orange paint or whatever this thing is and paint my Star Blast and maybe people will think that I have an Epsilon too. Well, if you want to do that, be my guest. Now, as with any Takahashi telescope, you know that purchasing the optical tube alone is just the beginning of you spending lots of money. You get used to seeing the words system chart. And although I wasn't even able to find a system chart for this older Epsilon 130, the ones for the new Epsilon 130D do exist online. And if you look at it, it's actually fairly tame as far as system charts go. Now, this unit is on loan from me from the staff at the Granger Observatory at Phillips Exeter Academy. That's the famous boarding school here in Exeter, New Hampshire, about 40 miles east of here. Now, this unit was designed for film astrophotography. There's no reason why you can't use it for digital astrophotography, but I was warned that it might not perform quite as well as I might expect. One explanation for this is that film, cellulose, is a flat piece of plastic and lays across like this across the film plane. Well, the camera sensor it actually isn't completely flat. There are little micro lenses and ridges. You can't actually see them, but they are there. And with a steep cone of light coming in at f3.3, the edges may not receive even illumination, and there may be some weird vignetting or field flatness issues. And I certainly did find this out. So when I took these images and I didn't use flats, let's go ahead and put this up. Look at the edges. There's a weird ring effect there. There's some vignetting. And when you add the flats, look at the, how that mostly goes away. It doesn't completely go away, and I couldn't get it to completely go away. So again, the new unit is $2,600 just for the optical tube. But again, you're probably going to have to spend a lot more money than that. Uh, the finder, these Takashi finders are beautiful. They don't come cheap. Even the bracket isn't cheap. And you've got the mount and, needless to say, all of that astrophotography equipment as well. The construction of this model, really quite beautiful and bulletproof. Um, very well made, as most Takahashis are. The telescope has six collimation screws in the back and three more on the secondary. Fairly conventional set up there. Get used to looking at those collimation screws because you're going to be using them quite a bit, at least in the beginning. This unit arrived in a fairly good state of collimation, but as I found out at f3.3, good enough is not good enough. It has to be perfect. And in fact, I spent close to four nights collimating this thing to the point where it was satisfactory. How do the images look? Well, this was a bit of a mixed bag, and part of the reason this review took so long is I had trouble getting some good images out of this thing sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Here's what I found on bright objects like M8 or the Dumbbell Nebula. I could put a camera up to this thing and get images in blazingly fast speeds. This Dumbbell Nebula picture was taken with frames lasting as little as nine seconds. Wow. Same thing with the Lagoon Nebula here. I think I, those are 14 second subframes and I just stacked a bunch of them together. The curious thing is that when I tried to use this on dim objects like the North America or the Veil, 
I figured I could get away with slightly longer subframes, 25 to 30 seconds. I figured that would be enough, uh, but it wasn't. It was not good. And in fact, I had to keep increasing those times uh, all the way up to about 90 seconds for the North American Nebula and for the Veil in order for it to come out well. Now, the results were decent, but I'm kind of wondering why it's f3.3. I get images of this quality through refractors, including some of Takahashi's own, in as little as 30 to 45 seconds. Okay, so let's take a look at the various configurations you can put this thing into if by some strange coincidence you wind up with one of these. Here's the telescope tube. This is a one-foot ruler for comparison. And this is the focuser, and you'll notice it doesn't have much focus travel. That's it. That's all you get. I'm measuring it at less than one inch. In normal configuration, inch and a quarter, eyepiece, and you can go observing this way. Interesting thing about this, although it was uh, meant for full frame and even medium format cameras, I find no reference anywhere that this can be used with uh, two inch accessories. So it looks like we're inch and a quarter only until um, I find something else. So let's say you wanted to do something like put a camera on it. And let's pick one of these. Here's a T3i, the normal thing to do. Take the eyepiece out. You get this thing, it's a T-ring. Take the cap off. Looks like I've got a light pollution filter on this one. Put the T-ring on. And then you've got this little doohickey here, which many of you have. It emulates the end of an inch and a quarter eyepiece, like this and then you can put the camera in like this. Now, unfortunately, although this fits, it will not work. Why won't it work? Because the sensor sits all the way back here and you can't physically put the focuser in enough. And even if you took out all of these spacers, you actually can't come to focus with this camera. So we have to do something else. So here's the something else that we do. Actually, this entire piece comes off like this and you can see there is a beautiful ED corrector lens element there. Be careful when you put this on, you could stick a Barlow in there and the end of the Barlow could hit that. Be really, really careful. So the thing that you would normally do, you would think works, is you tap the T-ring and then you thread this on. Unfortunately, this is a Canon T-ring. I've got a bunch of these here. This is a, I think this is another Canon. This is an Olympus. This is a Nikon. I've got a couple of Sonys. I think I have a Pentax. Unfortunately, none of these things work. They all won't fit because of th the threading is too wide. What you have to get is a Takahashi wide mount adapter. And unfortunately, your, your $10 or $20 investment here turns into a $100 investment here. So you get, to look, you get to look forward to that. That threads in here like this. And you wanna know just what a crazy guy I am. I actually have three of these things. So once this is threaded in like this, and you can take pictures this way. Now, you can't rotate this focuser, so whatever that orientation is, you're stuck with it. In some cases, this worked for me. In some cases, I really, really wish I could have rotated it and you notice you still don't have a lot of focus travel. It's nothing there changes. And the actual focus position is almost all the way to the bottom. You almost can't find focus with this Canon camera. And here's the telescope on a medium size mount. Handsome telescope, cuts an impressive profile on the observing field. I can almost guarantee if you set up one of these, people are going to come over and look at it. It doesn't look like anything else. Again, 15 and a half pounds, pushing it a little bit on a mount like this, you're going to need on a mid-size mount the largest of the supplied counterweights. That is typically the one weighing 11, 12, or 13 pounds. Now, once you add all of your imaging equipment, the camera, the auto guider, and whatever else you use, you're very likely going to need at least one other small counterweight. Be sure that you have one handy. Now, when I imaged, I actually wound up taking off this finder and putting a cheap red dot finder on it just to save weight. Oh, I know it's a beautiful finder, but the thing weighs so much, anything to get the weight down. And again, this telescope is set up for imaging. Now the staff at the observatory 
used it that way in the film era. And in fact, there's even an adapter to use this thing with a medium format camera. Of course, I used it for imaging myself, but I'll tell you what surprised me is how much I enjoyed looking through this thing. Uh, yeah, I know, what a concept, right? Looking through your telescope. But I used, uh, I used it and I just looked around and I had a lot of fun. Keep in mind at f3.3, you're going to start running into exit pupil issues pretty fast. Even with a 15, 16 millimeter eyepiece, the exit pupil's getting fairly large. I wound up using this 13 millimeter Nagler Type 6, and it was perfect for framing things like, you know, the ring and the dumbbell. And Now this telescope is set up for deep sky imaging, but there's no reason why you can't take pictures of the moon or the planets with it. And I ran some brief experiments with this. So you could put this imager in here, but what I found is you can't get close enough. It, the focuser doesn't go far down enough for you to reach focus. But if you have one of these new ZWO ASI minis, it actually will fit down here if you press it all the way in and it will reach focus. Now, you wanna be careful. There's a big, expensive ED lens right here. You don't wanna push the thing too far down. But I ran some quick experiments and I, you know, I wasn't designed for this, but the results, they were okay. So how do these images look? We'll take a look at this gallery. So there you have it, an overview of a most unusual and rare Takahashi, the Epsilon 130 non-D version. Do you have one of these? I've been in contact in my entire time in astronomy with a grand total of two people who have owned these things, and one of them was the staff at the observatory that I borrowed it from. So if you have any insights, please put them below. I'd like to hear them. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.